Acknowledgements. This book has been published thanks to the faithful support and encouragement of David Moberg, Mark Sweeney, and the rest of the staff of worldwide publishing groups. For years we have enjoyed close and faithful fellowship which makes me thankful to the Lord for the ministry these dear friends have had in so many of my published works. I am particularly grateful to Mary Hollinsworth and Catherine Murray of the World Groups, who, under very tight deadlines, worked hard to keep this book on track in the writing and editorial process. Your kindness, patience, and diligence have been exemplary, even under difficult circumstances. Thanks also to Gary Nussman who did the proofreading at various stages and offered many valuable suggestions. My special thanks go to Phil Johnson, who has worked alongside me as my senior editor for more than 20 years. Phil applied his talents in the process of translating this material from transcripts of my sermons on Matthew 10 and Luke 6, turning both series into one, while also making sure the text remained clear and engaging. Introduction. Over 20 years ago, while preaching the Gospel of Matthew, I gave a series of character studies on the Twelve Apostles. The messages were extraordinarily well received. We produced a cassette with a study guide from that series, titled The Master's Men. Through the years we have broadcast the complete series on the radio several times in the program Cruise Parity. Every time we put it on the air, it generates an increasing stream of positive reactions from the audience. After 20 years, that cassette is still one of the most popular series we've ever produced. A few years ago, I began teaching the Gospel of Luke verse by verse in our church. When I got to Luke 6 verses 13 to 16, where Luke records Jesus calling the Twelve, I preached a new series of messages on the Apostles. Again, the reaction was surprising and enthusiastic. As I preached the series, I realized that an entire generation had been born and come of age since we had last studied the lives of the disciples. This generation identified with these men in the same way that their fathers had more than two decades earlier. Some people who have practically memorized the first series say they keep finding surprisingly new, relevant, and practical things in the lives of the disciples. Very quickly the new series has become such a favorite that people began to urge me to combine all the material on the apostles in one book. I didn't need much prodding to do it. The book you are holding in your hands is the result of this. I have always been fascinated with the lives of the Twelve Apostles. Who isn't? The personality types of such men are familiar to us. They are just like us and like other people we know. They are affordable. They are real, living characters with whom we can identify. Their flaws and weaknesses, as well as their triumphs and charming features, are recorded in some of the most fascinating stories in the Bible. These are men we really want to meet. And this is because, in every way, they were ordinary men. None was recognized for their erudition or for their great knowledge. They were not orators or theologians. In fact, they lived outside of what was the religious system of Jesus' day. They did not stand out for natural talents or intellectual abilities. On the contrary, they were all prone to be wrong, fail, have wrong attitudes, lack faith, and experience bitter failure, and the best example of this was the leader of the group, Pedro. Even Jesus expressed that they were slow to learn and somewhat spiritually clumsy, Luke 24 verse 25. They represented the entire political spectrum. One was a former zealot, that is to say, a radical man, determined to defeat the Roman government by means of violence. Another had been a tax collector, practically a traitor to the Jewish nation, in feud with Rome. At least four, 
and possibly seven, were fishermen and close friends from the city of Capernaum, and it is likely that they had known each other since they were children. The others may have been merchants or artisans, because we are not told anything about what they did before they became followers of Jesus. Most were from the Galilee, a region dedicated to agriculture at the intersection of trade routes. And Galilee remained the base of operations for most of Jesus' ministry and not, as some might assume, Jerusalem in Judea, which was Israel's political and religious capital. But with all their character flaws and weaknesses, as ordinary men that they were, after Jesus' ascension, these men left an indelible impact on the world. His ministry continues to influence us to this day. God, by His grace, enabled and used them to inaugurate the spread of the gospel message and turn the world upside down, Acts of the Apostles 17 verse 6. Ordinary men, people like you and me, became instruments through which the message of Christ was carried to the ends of the earth. No wonder they are such fascinating people. The twelve were personally selected and called by Jesus. He knew them as only their Creator could know them compare John 1 verse 47. In other words, he knew all their faults long before he chose them. He even knew that Judas was going to betray him, John 6 verse 70, and chapter 13 verses 21 to 27, and yet he chose the betrayer and granted him all the privileges and blessings that he gave to others. Think about the implications of this, from our human perspective, the propagation of the gospel and the establishment of the church depended entirely on twelve men whose most notable characteristics were their status as simple men. Jesus selected them and prepared them for a time that is better measured in months than years. He taught them the scriptures and theology. He discipled them to live godly lives, teaching them, by example, to pray, forgive, and humbly serve one another. He gave them moral instruction. He spoke to them of the things that were to come to pass. And he used them as instruments to heal the sick, cast out demons, and do other miraculous works. Even three of them, Peter, James, and John, were able to briefly see Jesus in his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17 verses 1 to 9. It was a short but intense discipleship program. And when it was over, the night Jesus was betrayed, all the disciples, leaving him, fled, Matthew 26 verse 56. From an earthly point of view, the training program would seem like a monumental failure. It seemed that the disciples had forgotten or overlooked all that Jesus had taught them about each taking up his cross and following him. In fact, their own sense of failure was so profound that, for a while, they decided to go back to their old occupations. And even in that, it seems they failed, John 21 verse 3 and 4. But, encouraged by the risen Lord, they returned to their apostolic calling. When they received the power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, they boldly took up the task to which Jesus had called them. The work they undertook continues to this day, 2,000 years later. They are living proof that God's strength is made perfect in weakness. By themselves, it is evident that they were unfit for the task compare 2 Corinthians 2 verse 16. But God led them in triumph in Christ and through them spread the odor of his knowledge everywhere, verse 14. To get an idea of the brevity of his earthly time with Jesus, consider that Jesus' entire ministry from his baptism to his resurrection lasted only about three years and the intensive training with the disciples lasted about half that time. In his classic work, The Troop of Twelve, Alexander Balmain Bruce says that by the time Jesus identified and called the Twelve out of a larger group of followers, Matthew 10 verses 1 to 4, 
Luke 6 verses 12 to 16, he had already passed half of his earthly ministry. Jesus' selection of the twelve is an important milestone in the Gospel story. It divides the ministry of our Lord into two parts of almost the same duration, but unequal as to the extent and importance of the work done in each. In the first period, Jesus worked alone. His miraculous works were for the most part confined to a limited region, and his teaching was chiefly of an elementary character. But when he chose the twelve, the work of the kingdom had assumed such dimensions that organization and division of labor were required, and the teaching of Jesus began to be deeper and of a more elaborate nature, and his merciful activities developed over a wider area. The selection of a limited number to be his close companions and constant companions probably became a necessity for Christ as a result of his success in winning disciples. His followers, we suppose, had become so numerous that they became a burden and an impediment to his movements, especially in the long journeys which marked the latter part of his ministry. It was impossible that all who had believed could go with him in the literal sense, wherever he wanted to go such a large number could now be but occasional followers. But Jesus wanted certain selected men to be with him at all times and places, to accompany him on all his travels, to be witnesses to all he did, and to minister to him in his daily needs. And so, in the unique words of Mark, Jesus called to himself those he wanted, and they came to him. And he established twelve, to be with him, and to send them to preach, Mark 3 verses 13 and 14. That means those few men, whose backgrounds were in mundane business and earthly pursuits, had little more than 18 months of preparation for the monumental task to which they had been called. There was no second fiddle, no substitutes, no plan B in case all twelve failed. The strategy seems risky in the extreme. In earthly terms, the founding of the church and the spread of the gospel message depended entirely on those twelve ordinary men with all their foibles, and one of them even devilish enough to betray the Lord of the universe. And all of preparing them for the job took less than half the time it typically takes to earn a seminary degree today. But Jesus knew what he was doing. From his divine perspective, the ultimate success of his strategy actually depended on the Holy Spirit acting on these men to accomplish his sovereign will. It was a mission that could not fail. That is why it was a job for which only God deserves praise and glory. Those men were merely instruments in his hands, just as you and I can be God's instruments today. God loves to use such ordinary means, the foolish of the world God chose, to shame the wise, and the weak of the world chose God, to shame the strong, and the vile of the world and the despised God chose, and what is not, to undo what is, so that no one boasts in his presence, first letter to the Corinthians 1 verses 27 to 29. The two thousand years of triumph of apostolic effort are a testimony to the wisdom and power of divine strategy. Sometimes in scripture the twelve are called disciples mathets, in the Greek text Matthew 10 verse 1, chapter 11 verse 1, and chapter 20 verse 17, Luke 9 verse 1. The word means apprentices, students. This is what they were like during the months they spent under the direct and personal tutelage of the Lord. He had multitudes of disciples, but these twelve were specifically called and chosen for a unique apostolic office. Therefore, they are also called apostles, apostolos in the Greek. The word simply means messengers, sent. They were given the unique office of ambassadors and the authority to be spokesmen for Christ. Luke especially uses this term in his Gospel and throughout the Book of Acts and reserves this word almost exclusively for the Twelve. Matthew speaks of apostles, just once Matthew 10 verse 2 elsewhere, 
he refers to the twelve disciples. Chapter 11 verse 1 and chapter 20 verse 17, or to the 12, chapter 26 verse 14, 20 and 47. Similarly, Mark uses the term 12 disciples only once, Mark 6 verse 30. Elsewhere, the apostles are always referred to as the 12, chapter 3 verse 14, chapter 4 verse 10, chapter 6 verse 7, chapter 9 verse 35, chapter 10 verse 32, chapter 11 verse 11, and chapter 14 verse 10, 17, 20, and 43. John also uses the word apostles only once, in a non-technical sense, John 13 verse 16. Most of the Spanish language versions translate the expression as envoy or messenger. Like Mark, John always refers to the apostolic group as the Twelve, John 6 verses 67, 70 and 71, and chapter 20 verse 24. Luke 10 describes an incident where 70 followers of Jesus are chosen and sent out two by two. Obviously, they were envoys and some commentators refer to them as apostles, but Luke does not use that term to describe them. The twelve were called to a specific position. And in the Gospels and Acts the term apostle almost always refers to that office and to the twelve men who were specifically called and ordained to that office. Acts of the Apostles 14 verse 14 and the Pauline epistles make it clear that the Apostle Paul was likewise called to fill a special apostolic office, that of Apostle to the Gentiles Romans 11 verse 13. First letter to Timothy 2 verse 7. Second letter to Timothy 1 verse 11. Paul's apostleship was a unique calling. Obviously, he had the same authority and privileges as the 12th second letter to the Corinthians 11 verse 5. But Paul's apostleship is not going to be covered in this book because our focus here is on the twelve men who shared Jesus' public ministry with him and who were his closest friends and companions. Paul was not converted until after the ascension of Christ, Acts of the Apostles 9. He himself says that he was an apostle like a miscarriage, born out of time, first letter to the Corinthians 15 verse 8. He spoke with the same authority and manifested the same miraculous anointing that the Twelve had, and the Twelve welcomed him among themselves and recognized his authority, compare second letter of Peter 3 verses 15 and 16, although he was not one of them. The number Twelve is important, because Luke says that after the ascension of Jesus, the Apostles chose Matthias to fill the place left vacant by Judas, Acts of the Apostles 1 verses 23 to 26. The role of an Apostle, including the specific office to which the Apostle Paul was called, included a position of leadership and exclusive teaching authority in the early Church. The Apostles, or others very close to them, were the ones who wrote the books of the New Testament. And before the New Testament was written, the teaching of the Apostles was the norm in the early Church. Beginning with the first converts at Pentecost, all true believers recognized the leadership of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles 2 verse 37. And as the Church grew, its fidelity to the truth was described in these terms. They persevered in the Apostles' doctrine, Acts of the Apostles 2 verse 42. The Apostles were given supernatural power to perform signs and wonders, Matthew 10 verse 1, Mark 6 verses 7 and 13, Luke 9 verses 1 and 2, Acts of the Apostles 2 verses 3 and 4, and chapter 5 verse 12. These signs testified to the truth of the Gospel, which the Apostles had received from Christ and presented to the world in his name, second letter to the Corinthians 12 verse 12, Acts of the Apostles 2 verses 3 and 4. In other words, their role was fundamental. They are, in a real sense, the foundation of the Christian Church.
being the main cornerstone Jesus Christ himself, Ephesians 2 verse 20. These studies in the lives of the apostles have been a special delight to me, and one of the most fruitful endeavors in my life. My greatest joy is preaching Christ. Eleven of these men also had that passion, dedicated their lives to it, and triumphed even against overwhelming opposition. Despite their shortcomings, they are worthy heroes and role models for us. To study their lives is to get to know the men who were closest to Jesus in his earthly life. It is a blessing to realize that they were ordinary people like you and me. May the Spirit of Christ who taught them and transformed them into precious vessels for the teacher's use, do the same with us and that we can learn from their example what it really means to be disciples. Content. Chapter 1. Ordinary Men, An Uncommon Calling. Episode 2. Peter, the Impetuous Apostle. Chapter 3. Andrew, the Apostle of Small Things. Chapter 4. James, the Apostle of the Passion. Chapter 5. John, the Apostle of Love. Chapter 6. Felipe, the Analytical. Chapter 7. Nathaniel, in whom there is no guile. Chapter 8. Mateo, the Tax Collector, and Tomas, the Twin. Chapter 9. James the Younger, Simon the Zealot, and Judas not the Iscariot, who was the Apostle with three names. Chapter 10. Judas, the traitor. Chapter 1. Ordinary Men. An Unusual Call. Well look, brothers, your vocation, that you are not many wise according to the flesh, nor many powerful, nor many noble, but the foolish of the world chose God, to shame the wise, and the weak of the world chose God, to shame the strong, and God chose the vile of the world and the despised, and what is not, to undo what is, so that no one can boast in his presence. First letter to the Corinthians 1 verses 26 to 29. From the very beginning of his public ministry in his hometown of Nazareth, Jesus was tremendously controversial from his own community literally tried to kill him immediately after he delivered his first public address at the local synagogue. Upon hearing these things, everyone in the synagogue was filled with anger, and getting up, they threw him out of the city, and took him to the top of the mountain on which their city was built, to throw it off the cliff. But he passed through their midst, and left Luke 4 verses 28 to 30. Ironically, Jesus became tremendously popular with the people who lived in the larger Galilee region. As news of his miracles began to circulate throughout the area, large crowds came to see him and hear him speak. Luke 5 verse 1 says that the crowds pressed around him to hear the word of God. One day, the people were so large and pressing him so hard that he had to get into a boat and move far enough from the shore to continue speaking to them from there. Not coincidentally, the boat Jesus chose belonged to Simon. Jesus was to give him a new name, Peter, and Peter was to become the dominant person in the disciples' inner circle. Some might think that if Jesus had wanted his message to have maximum impact, he should have exploited its popularity more effectively. Modern conventional wisdom might suggest that Jesus should have done everything he could to exploit his fame, diffuse the controversy sparked by his teaching, and employ whatever strategies he could have used to swell the crowds around him. But Jesus did not do that. Rather, he did the complete opposite. Rather than take the populist route and exploit his fame, he emphasized the things that made his message so controversial. By the time the crowds reached their peak, he was preaching a message that caused so much open opposition, 
and was so offensive in its content, that the crowds moved away, leaving only a few faithful, John 6 verses 66 and 67. Among those who remained with him were the twelve, whom he had personally selected and appointed to represent him. They were twelve ordinary men, nothing exceptional. But Christ's strategy to advance his kingdom revolved around these twelve men rather than the cheering crowds. He decided to work through the availability of these few flawed individuals rather than carry out his agenda through the force of mobs, military might, his personal popularity, or a public relations campaign. From a human perspective, the future of the church and the long-term success of the gospel depended entirely on the faithfulness of that handful of disciples. If they failed, there was no second plan, that is, an alternative plan. The strategy that Jesus chose typified the character of his kingdom. The kingdom of God will not come with warning, nor will they say, Lo, here, or lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you, Luke 17 verses 20 and 21. The advancement of the kingdom is not with an army, nor with force, but with my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 4 verse 6. A dozen men under the power of the Holy Spirit are a more powerful force than crowds whose initial enthusiasm for Jesus had apparently been sparked by little more than simple curiosity. Christ personally chose the twelve and invested most of his energy in them. He chose them before they chose him, John 15 verse 16. The selection and calling process occurred in different stages. A cursory reading of scripture might suggest that John 1 verses 35 to 51, Luke 5 verses 3 to 11, and the formal calling of the twelve in Luke 6 verses 12 to 16 are contradictory accounts of how Christ called his apostles. But there is no contradiction. The passages are simply describing different stages of the calling of the apostles. In John 1 verses 35 to 51, for example, Andrew, John, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel met Jesus for the first time. This took place near the beginning of Jesus' ministry, in the desert near the Jordan River, where John the Baptist was ministering. Andrew, John and the others were there because they were already disciples of John the Baptist. But when they heard their teacher point to Jesus and say, Behold the Lamb of God, they followed Jesus. That was phase one of his calling. It was a call to conversion. It illustrates how each disciple is first called to salvation. It is necessary to recognize Jesus as the true Lamb of God and Lord of all and accept Him by faith. That stage in the calling of disciples did not mean full-time discipleship. The Gospel accounts suggest that although they were followers of Jesus in the sense that they willingly listened to his teaching and submitted to him as their teacher, they went on with their usual jobs, earning a living through regular activity. That's why from this point until Jesus called them into a full-time ministry, we often see them fishing and mending their nets. Phase 2 of his call was a call to ministry. Luke 5 describes the event in detail. This was the occasion when Jesus moved away from the seashore to escape the pressure of the crowds and taught from Peter's boat. After he had finished teaching, he told Peter to put out into the deep and let down the nets. Pedro did so even though it was not the best time of day to fish, fishing was more productive at night when the water was colder and the fish came to the surface to eat, nor was it the most appropriate place, usually, the fish were feeding in shallow water where it was easy to fish, and Pedro was exhausted, having been fishing all night with no results. He told Jesus, Master, we have been working all night, and we have caught nothing but at your word I will cast the net, Luke 5 verse 5. The result was such a huge catch that their nets broke and two of their boats nearly sank, verses 6 to 7. 
It was in the context of this miracle that Jesus said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, Matthew 4 verse 19. Scripture says that it was at this point that they left everything and followed him, Luke 5 verse 11. According to Matthew, Andrew and Peter immediately leaving the nets, followed him, Matthew 4 verse 20. And James and John immediately leaving the boat and their father, followed him, verse 22. From that point on, they were inseparable from the Lord. Matthew 10 verses 1 to 4 and Luke 6 verses 12 to 16 describe a third phase of his calling. This was his call to the apostolate. It was at this point that Jesus selected and named twelve particular men and made them his apostles. This is how Lucas relates the event. In those days he went to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples, and he chose twelve of them, whom he also called apostles. Simon, whom he also called Peter, Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James son of Alphaeus, Simon called Zealot, Judas brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became the traitor. His apostolate began with a kind of boarding school. Christ commanded them to leave. Mark 6 verse 7 says that they went two by two. At this point, they were not yet ready to go out on their own, so Christ arranged them into pairs so that they could offer each other support. Through this phase of their training, the Lord himself stayed close to them. It was like the mother eagle, watching the eaglets when they start to fly. They were always communicating with Jesus, reporting how things were going, compare Luke 9 verse 10, chapter 10 verse 17. And after a couple of stages of evangelistic work, they returned to the Lord and stayed with him for a longer time of teaching ministry, fellowship or rest, Mark 6 verses 30 to 34. There was a fourth phase in his calling, which took place after the resurrection of Jesus. Judas was no longer with the group. He had hanged himself after betraying Christ. In his resurrected body, Jesus appeared to the eleven and sent them out into all the world, telling them to go through the nations making disciples. This was, in reality, a call to martyrdom. In the end, each one of them gave his life for the gospel. History records that all but one were killed for their testimony. Only John is said to have reached old age, although he was harshly persecuted for the name of Christ, going into exile on the small island of Patmos. Despite the obstacles they had to face, they succeeded. In the midst of great persecutions and even martyrdom, they fulfilled their task. Against all odds, they entered victorious into glory, and the continuing witness to the gospel, spanning over 2,000 years and reaching virtually every corner of the earth, is a testament to the wisdom of God's strategy. No wonder we are fascinated by the lives of these men. Let us begin our study of the Twelve by looking carefully at Phase 3 of their call, their selection and appointment to the Apostleship. Let us note the details as given by Luke. Time. First, the timing of this call is important. Luke makes this point with the first sentence of Luke 6 verse 12, in those days. The New International Version says it this way, at that time. Lucas is not talking about time on a clock, or specific days of a specific month. For that time, and in those days, refers to a period of time, a season, a specific phase in the ministry of Jesus. It was an interval in his ministry, when the opposition was raging. In those days, it takes us immediately to the preceding story. This section of Luke's Gospel records the violent opposition that Jesus had begun to receive from the scribes and Pharisees.
Luke 5 verse 17 is Luke's first mention of the Pharisees, and verse 21 is the first use of the word scribes. In verse 17 the scribes are mentioned along with the Pharisees as doctors of the law. Thus, in Luke 5 verse 17 we are confronted with the main adversaries of Jesus, and Luke's account of their opposition runs through the text to the end of chapter 5 and continues in chapter 6. Luke describes the growing conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders of Judaism. They rose up against him when he healed a paralytic and forgave his sins, chapter 5 verses 17 to 26. They objected to seeing him eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners, chapter 5 verses 27 to 39. They also opposed Jesus when he allowed his disciples to pluck ears and eat on the Sabbath, chapter 6 verses 1 to 5, and when he healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, chapter 6 verses 6 to 11. Closing parenthesis. One after the other, Luke recounts these incidents and highlights the growing opposition from the religious leaders. The conflict reaches its climax in Luke 6 chapter 11. The scribes and the Pharisees were filled with fury, and they were talking among themselves what they could do against Jesus. Marcos and Matteo are even more graphic. They say that the religious leaders wanted to destroy Jesus, Matthew 12 chapter 14, Mark 3 verse 6. Mark says that the religious leaders managed to involve Herod's followers in the plot. Herod's followers were a political faction that supported the Herodian dynasty. They were not usually allies with the Pharisees, but the two groups banded together against Jesus and began plotting how to put him to death. It is at this precise point that Luke inserts his account of how Jesus chose the twelve and appointed them to be apostles. It was in those days, when the hostility against Jesus had reached the point of procuring his assassination. Hatred for Jesus among the religious elite had reached a climax. Jesus could feel the pressure of the proximity of his death. The crucifixion was less than two years from that date. He knew that he would have to suffer death on the cross, that he would rise from the dead and that after forty days he would ascend to where his father is. Therefore, he also knew that his earthly work would be passed on to others. The time had come to select and prepare their official representatives. Jesus, aware of the hatred that the religious leaders had for him, fully aware of the hostility that had arisen against him, seeing the inevitability of his execution, chose twelve key men to carry out the proclamation of his gospel for the salvation of Israel and the establishment of its church. The time had come. There were not many days left, only about eighteen months, by most estimates before his earthly ministry came to an end. Now was the time to choose his apostles. The most intense preparation was to begin immediately and be completed in a matter of months. The focus of Christ's ministry then shifted from the multitudes to these few. Without a doubt, it was the evident reality of his death at the hands of his adversaries that marked the turning point. There is another stark reality to all of this. When Jesus chose the twelve to make them his official representatives, that is, preachers of the gospel who would proclaim his message and his authority, He did not choose a single rabbi, nor a scribe, nor a Pharisee, nor a Sadducee. He did not choose a priest. None of the men she chose came from the religious establishment. The choice of the twelve apostles was a judgment against institutionalized Judaism. It was a rejection of those men and their organizations that had become totally corrupted. That is why Jesus did not choose a single religious leader. Instead, he chose men who had no theological training, fishermen, tax collectors and other common men. Jesus had long been at odds with those who saw themselves as the religious nobility of Israel. They felt wronged. 
They rejected him and his message. They hated it. The Gospel of John says it this way. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. John 1 verse 11. The religious leaders of Judaism constituted the core of those who rejected it. About a year and a half prior to this, in one of the first official acts of Jesus' ministry, he had challenged Israel's religious leaders on their own property in Jerusalem during the Passover, the only time in the year when the city fell. It was full of pilgrims who came to offer sacrifices. Jesus went to the temple, made a whip with ropes, expelled the money changers from the temple, throwing their coins on the ground, overturning the tables and letting the animals go free, John 2 verses 13 to 16. With that, he dealt a heavy blow to institutionalized Judaism. He unmasked the religious nobility exposing them as thieves and hypocrites. It doomed their spiritual bankruptcy. He exposed his apostasy. He publicly condemned his sin. He accused them of flagrant corruption. He denounced its falsehood. This is how his ministry began. It was a true assault on the institutionalized religion of the Jews. Several months later, at the height of his ministry in Galilee, far from Jerusalem, the resentment that must have been born of that first event had reached its peak. The religious leaders were thirsty for blood. And they began to plot a trap to kill him. His rejection of him was complete. They were hostile to the gospel that he preached. They despised the doctrine of grace it upheld, rejected the repentance it demanded, scorned the forgiveness it offered, and repudiated the faith it embodied. Despite the many miracles that attested to his messianic credentials, despite seeing with their own eyes how he cast out demons, healed all disease, and raised the dead, they would never accept the fact that he was God in human form. They just hated it and they hated his message. Jesus was a threat to their power so they desperately wanted to see him dead. So when the time came for Jesus to select the twelve apostles, it was normal for him not to choose people of the kind who were so ready to destroy him. Instead he turned to his humble followers and from among them he selected twelve simple, ordinary men belonging to the working class. The Twelve Men if you have ever visited the great cathedrals of Europe, you may have thought that the apostles were remarkable saints like those depicted in stained glass windows, with luminous halos that represented and exalted some degree of spirituality. But the truth is that they were very ordinary men. It is a pity that they are often placed on pedestals as figures of magnificent marble or painted as ancient Roman gods that dehumanizes them. Because they were just twelve ordinary men, human in every way. We must not overlook who they really were. I recently read a biography of William Tyndale, who pioneered the translation of the Bible into the English language. He believed that it was not right for ordinary people to hear the Bible read only in Latin and not in their own language. The church leaders of those days, incredibly, did not want the Bible in the language of the people because, like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, they feared losing their ecclesiastical power. But against his opposition, Tyndale translated the New Testament into English and published it. For his efforts he was rewarded with exile, poverty and persecution. Finally, in 1536, he was strangled and burned at the stake. One of the things that motivated Tyndale to translate the scripture into the common language was a survey of the English clergy which revealed that most of them did not even know who the twelve apostles were. Only a few could name four or five of the apostles. Today's church leaders and Christians arguably do no better than English clergy. In reality, what the institutional church has done by canonizing these men has been to dehumanize them and make them seem far away and not of this world.
It is a strange irony because when Jesus chose them, he selected them not because of some extraordinary ability or spiritual superiority. Rather it seems that he deliberately chose men who stood out for their simplicity. What qualified these men to be apostles? Obviously it was not an intrinsic ability or an extraordinary own talent. They were Galileans. They did not belong to any elite. The Galileans were considered to be of the lower class, peasant people and lacking in education. They were commoners, insignificant. But Jesus did not select them because they would have been more distinguished or more talented than others in Israel at that time. Undoubtedly, those who are going to occupy this or another kind of leadership in the church have to gather certain moral and spiritual qualities. In fact, the demands for spiritual leadership in the church are extremely high. Think, for example, of the qualities for a pastor or elder mentioned in 1 Timothy 3 verses 2-7. But it is necessary that the bishop be blameless, husband of one wife, sober, prudent, decorous, hospitable, apt to teach, not given to wine, not quarrelsome, not greedy for dishonest gain, but gentle, mild-mannered, not miserly. Let him rule his house well, keep his children in subjection with all honesty, for he who does not know how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a neophyte, lest being puffed up he fall into the condemnation of the devil. It is also necessary that they have good testimony from outsiders, so that they do not fall into disrepute and into the snare of the devil. Titus 1 verses 6 to 9 gives a similar list. Hebrews 13 verse 7 also suggests that church leaders should be an example of moral and spiritual values, because their faith should be the kind that others want to follow and they will have to give an account to God for the way they conducted themselves. These are very high standards. By the way, the rules are no less for the people of the congregation. Leaders are examples for others. There are no lower standards for ordinary members. In fact, in Matthew 5 verse 48 Jesus said to all believers, Be ye therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Frankly, no one can meet such a standard. Humanly speaking, no one qualifies when the norm is perfection. No one is qualified to be in God's kingdom and no one is inherently worthy of being in God's service. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 23. There is no righteous, not even one, Romans 3 verse 10. Remember, it was Paul's maturity that confessed, I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, no good dwells, Romans 7 verse 18. In the first letter to Timothy 1 verse 15, he says of himself that he is the chief of sinners. So there are no intrinsically qualified people. God himself must save sinners, sanctify them, and then transform them from disqualified into instruments he can use. The twelve were like the rest of us. They were selected from among the unworthy and the unqualified. They were, like Elijah, men subject, to passions like ours, James 5 verse 17. They did not reach the greatest heights of service because they were somehow different from us. Their transformation into vessels of honor was solely the work of the potter. Many Christians become discouraged and discouraged when their spiritual life and testimony suffer because of sin or failure. We have a tendency to think that we are worthless, and if we were left to ourselves, that would be true. But worthless people are just the kind of people God uses, because they're the only kind of people he counts on to work with. Satan may be able to try to convince us that our deficiencies make us worthless to God and his church.
But Jesus' choice of his apostles testifies to the fact that God can use the unworthy and the unqualified. He can use nobody. These twelve turned the whole world upside down, Acts 17 verse 6. It was not because they had extraordinary talents, exceptional intellectual abilities, powerful political influences, or any special social status. They turned the world upside down because God worked in them to do it. God chooses the lowly, the low, the meek and the weak, so that there is not the slightest doubt about what is the source of power when their lives change the world. It is not the man. It is the truth of God and the power of God in man. Today we need to remind some preachers of this. It's not his intelligence or his personality. The power is in the word, the truth that we preach, and not in us. And aside from the person, an extraordinary human being who was God-made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the story of God's work on earth is his story of using the unworthy and molding it for use in the same way that the potter molds the unworthy. Mud. The twelve were no exception. Of course, the apostles deserve the unique place they occupy in redemptive history. Certainly they are worthy of being considered heroes of the faith. The book of Revelation says that their names will adorn the twelve gates of the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, so that heaven itself pays them eternal tribute. But such a fact does not diminish the truth that they were just as ordinary as you and me. We need to remember them not because of their image in the stained glass windows but because of the very human way in which the Bible presents them to us. We must bring them out of their otherworldly darkness and meet them as real people. We need to think of them as men of flesh and blood and not exalted figures in the pantheon of religious ritualism. However, we must not underestimate the importance of his position either. After their election, the twelve apostles actually became the true spiritual leaders of Israel. The religious elite of apostate Israel were symbolically set aside when Jesus chose them. The apostles became the first preachers of the new covenant. They were the first to be entrusted with the Christian gospel. They represented the true Israel of God, a genuinely repentant and believing Israel. They also became the foundation stones of the church, with Jesus himself as the cornerstone Ephesians 2 verse 20. These truths are enhanced and not diminished by the fact that these men were so ordinary. Again, this is perfectly consistent with the way the Lord always works. In the first letter to the Corinthians 1 verses 20 and 21, we read, Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God maddened the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God to save the believers through the folly of preaching. That is why there were no philosophers, no brilliant writers, no famous apologists, no eminent teachers, no men who had distinguished themselves as great orators among whom Christ chose. They became great spiritual leaders and great preachers under the power of the Holy Spirit, but it was not because of the innate oratory skills, leadership abilities, or academic qualifications that these men would have had. Their influence is due to one thing only, the power of the message they preached. On a human level, the gospel was seen as a foolish message, and the apostles were seen as naive preachers. The elite considered his teaching of low quality. Those who offered it were simple fishermen and obscure members of the working class. They were pawns, populist people. They were valued by their contemporaries. The same has been true of the true Church of Christ throughout history. It is also true in today's evangelical world. Where are the notable intellectuals, the most successful writers, and the great speakers whom the world regards as such? They are usually not found in the church.
Well, look, brothers, your vocation, that there are not many wise according to the flesh, nor many powerful, nor many noble. First letter to the Corinthians 1 verse 26. But the foolish of the world chose God, to shame the wise, and the weak of the world chose God, to shame the strong and the vile of the world and the despised God chose, and what is not, to undo what is, so that no one can boast in his presence verses 27 to 29. God's favorite instruments are nobodies so that no man can boast in his presence. In other words, God chooses whom he chooses to receive glory from. Choose weak instruments so that no one attributes power to human instruments instead of attributing it to God, who exercises authority over those instruments. Such a strategy is unacceptable for those whose sole purpose in life is directed at achieving human glory. With the notable exception of Judas Iscariot, these men were not like that. Certainly, like all fallen human beings, they fought with pride and arrogance. But the passion of their lives became the glory of Christ. And it is that passion, brought under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and not some innate ability or human talent, that explains why they made such an indelible impact on the world. Teacher. Keep in mind, then, that the selection of the twelve took place at the time when Jesus was faced with the reality of his impending death. He had experienced increasing hostility from religious leaders. He knew that his earthly mission would soon culminate in his death, resurrection, and ascension. So from this point on, the character of his ministry changed. His number one priority was preparing the men who would be the main spokesmen for the gospel after he was gone. How did he choose them? First, he sought communication with his father. In those days he went to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. Luke 6 chapter 12. In the first five chapters of his gospel, Luke has already made it clear that prayer was a norm in the life of Jesus. Luke 5 verse 16 says, But he withdrew to desert places, and prayed. It was a habit in him to seek solitude to talk with his father. When he was in the towns and villages of Galilee, he was always feeling the pressure of the crowds that followed him. Desert and mountainous regions offered him the right solitary environment in which to pray. We do not know what this mount was. If it mattered, scripture would have told us. In the north of Galilee there are a large number of hills and mountains. This mount was probably close to Capernaum, within a short walk's radius. Capernaum was a kind of base for the ministry of Jesus. He went there and spent the whole night praying. We often see Jesus praying before momentous events occurred in his ministry. Remember that this was what he did on the night when he was betrayed. He prayed in the garden where he had found solitude, far from the hectic atmosphere of Jerusalem. Judas knew he could find it there, because according to Luke 22 verse 39, Jesus used to go there to pray. Here we see Jesus in all his humanity. I was in the middle of an extremely changing situation. The hostility that was plotted against him anticipated his death. He had very little time left to prepare the men who would be in charge of spreading the gospel throughout the world after his departure. And the cold reality of the facts took him to the top of the mountain to be able to pray to God in complete solitude. He had not sought fame but had taken the form of a servant, coming to earth as a man. The moment when he would have to humble himself to death, and death on a cross, was drawing near. So he went to God as a man would, seeking the face of God in prayer and communicating with the Father about the man he had chosen for this vital function. Notice that he spent the whole night praying. If he went to the mountains before dark, it is likely that he went at seven or eight in the afternoon.
If he came down from the mountain after dawn, it might have been six in the morning. In other words, he was praying for at least ten hours straight. To say that he spent the whole night praying, several words are needed in Spanish. In the Greek, however, only one is required. Dionictiruo. The word is important. Talk about sticking to a task all night. To refer to the fact that he spent the night sleeping, this word would not have been used. It is not an expression that is used to say that it was dark all night. It has the sense of working through the night, of keeping up with something all night. It suggests that Jesus stayed awake in the dark until morning, and that he persevered the whole time in prayer with an immense weight of duty, of commitment, on him. Another interesting note arises from the Greek although we do not see it in Spanish. Our versions say that he spent the night praying to God. The expression in the Greek actually means that he spent the whole night in God's prayer. Every time he prayed, he literally prayed God's prayer. He was involved in an intertrinitarian communion. The prayer offered was precisely the prayer of God. The members of the Trinity communicated with each other. His prayers were all perfectly consistent with the mind and will of God, for he himself is God. And in that we see the incredible mystery of his humanity and his deity acting at the same time. In his human condition, Jesus needed to pray all night, and in his deity, he prayed the true prayer of God. Understand this. The decision that Jesus was to make very soon was of such importance that it required 10 to 12 hours of preparatory prayer. What was he asking for in his prayer? Clarity as to who to choose. I don't believe it. As the incarnate omniscient God, the divine will was not a mystery to him. No doubt he was praying for the men whom he would soon choose, communicating with the Father about the absolute wisdom of his choice and acting as a mediator on their behalf. When the night of prayer had come to an end, he returned to where the disciples were and gathered them together. And when it was day, he called his disciples, Luke 6 verse 13. He didn't just call the twelve. In this context, the word disciples refers to his followers in a broad sense. The word itself means, student, apprentice. There must have been numerous disciples and from among them he was to choose twelve to fulfill the office of an apostle. In Jesus' day it was common, in both Greek and Jewish culture, for a prominent rabbi or philosopher to attract students. His teaching place was not necessarily a classroom or an auditorium. Most were itinerant instructors whose students simply followed them through the normal course of daily life. That is the kind of ministry that Jesus had with his followers. He was an itinerant teacher. He just went from place to place and as he taught, he attracted people who followed his movements and listened to his teaching. Verse 1 gives us a picture of this. It came to pass on a Sabbath day, as Jesus passed through the fields, his disciples plucked ears of corn and ate, rubbing them with their hands. They walked with him, following him from place to place as he taught, gleaning grain to eat as they went. We do not know how many disciples Jesus had. On one occasion, he sent out seventy of them in pairs to evangelize the communities that he would later visit, Luke 10 verse 1. But the total number of his followers was undoubtedly much more than seventy. The scripture says that crowds followed him. And why not? His teaching was utterly unlike any other in its clarity, and its authority was obvious. He had the ability to heal diseases, cast out demons, and raise the dead. He was full of grace and truth. It is not surprising that he drew so many disciples to himself. The surprising thing is that someone rejected it. But they did reject him, because his message was more than they could bear.
In John 6 we see something of this dynamic. At the beginning of the chapter, he fed more than 5,000 people who had come out to see him. John 6 verse 10 says that the men alone were 5,000. If the women and children were counted, the crowd could easily have been double that number or even larger. It was a wonderful day. Many of these people were already following him as disciples, while many others were undoubtedly preparing to be. John writes, Those men then, seeing the sign that Jesus had done, said, This truly is the prophet who was to come into the world. Verse 14. Who was this man who could produce food out of nothing? They spent most of their lives in the fields, harvesting crops, raising animals, and preparing meals. But Jesus could just create food. That would change their lives. They must have thought about the enjoyment of free time and free food, already prepared. This was the kind of Messiah they had been waiting for. According to John, they would come to seize him and make him king. Verse 15. But he escaped them through a series of supernatural events that culminated in their walking through the water. The next day the people found him in Capernaum, on the other side of the lake. Crowds of them had been searching for him, obviously hoping he would give them more to eat. But he scolded them for following him for the wrong reasons. They seek me, not because they saw the signs, but because they ate the bread and were filled. Verse 26. When they insisted on asking him for food, he told them, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Verse 51. Those words were so difficult to understand that they asked him to explain them. He then told them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Because my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven not as your fathers ate manna, and died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue, teaching in Capernaum, verses 53 to 59. This statement offended them so much that many of his disciples began to doubt whether they would follow him or not. John writes, From then on many of his disciples turned back and walked no more with him. Chapter 6 verse 66. So the disciples came and went. People were attracted and then disappointed. And on that particular occasion described in John 6, Jesus even said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Verse 67. Peter spoke for the group when he responded, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life and we have believed and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, verses 68 and 69. Those who remained were people to whom God had sovereignly brought his own Son, verse 44. Jesus also, in a particular way, had brought them to himself. He told them, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and ordained you, that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. John 15 verse 16. He sovereignly selected and, with the exception of Judas Iscariot, whom Jesus knew would betray him, sovereignly worked in and through them to ensure that they would persevere with him, bear fruit, and that their fruit would remain. Here we see the principle of God's elective grace at work. We see the sovereignty of his selection in an extraordinary way in the selection of the twelve. 
Out of a large number of disciples, perhaps hundreds of them, he chose twelve particular men and appointed them to apostolic office or office. It was not a job for which they were looking for interested parties or volunteers. Jesus sovereignly chose and named them, in the presence of the larger group. This was a remarkable moment for those twelve men. Until that moment, Pedro, Jacobo, Juan, Andres, Nathaniel, Mateo and the others were just part of the crowd. They were apprentices like any other in the group. They had been following, listening, observing and absorbing the master's teachings. But they still had no official leadership role. They had not been appointed to any position that set them apart from the rest. They were faces in the crowd until Jesus selected them and made twelve of them apostles. Why twelve? Why not eight? Why not twenty-four? The number twelve is full of symbolic values. Twelve were the tribes of Israel. But Israel was apostate. The Judaism of Jesus' time represented a corruption of the Old Testament faith. Israel had abandoned divine grace in favor of religion by works. His religion was legalistic. It was full of hypocrisy, self-righteous deeds, human regulations, and meaningless ceremonies. It was heretical. It was based on Abraham's physical descendants rather than Abraham's faith. By choosing twelve apostles, Jesus was actually establishing a new leadership for the new covenant. And the apostles represented the new leaders of the true Israel of God, made up of people who believed the gospel and were followers of the faith of Abraham. Compare Romans 4 verse 16. In other words, the twelve apostles symbolized the judgment against the twelve tribes of the Israel of the Old Testament. Jesus himself made the connection quite clearly. In Luke 22 verses 29 and 30, he told the apostles, Therefore I assign to you a kingdom, as my Father assigned to me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The importance of the number twelve would become immediately obvious to almost all Israelites. Jesus' messianic claims were clear to all who heard his teachings. He constantly spoke of his coming kingdom. Meanwhile, throughout Israel, the hope that the Messiah would soon appear and establish his kingdom was growing. Some believed that John the Baptist would be that Messiah, but John pointed to Christ, compare John 1 verses 19 to 27. They knew very well that Christ had all the messianic credentials, John 10 verses 41 and 42. He was not the kind of political leader they expected, which is why they were so slow to believe, John 10 verses 24 and 25. But they certainly understood the claims he was making, which filled them with hope. So when he publicly named the twelve to be his apostles, the significance of that number was stark and clear. The apostles represented a completely new Israel, under the new covenant. And his appointment, bypassing the religious system of official Judaism, meant a message of judgment against the nation of Israel. Obviously, these twelve ordinary men were not destined to play an ordinary role. They took the place of the head of the twelve tribes. They were living proof that the kingdom Jesus was about to establish was completely different from the kingdom most Israelites expected. Luke 6 verse 13 says, He chose twelve of them, whom he also called apostles. The title alone was significant. The Greek verb apostello means, to send. The noun form, Apostolos, means, one who is sent. The Spanish word apostle is a transliteration rather than a translation of the Greek word. The apostles were, sent. But they were not just messengers. The Greek word for, messenger, was angelos, from which we get the word, angel.
An apostolos was something more important than a messenger or a herald. Apostolos communicated the idea of ambassador, delegate, official representative. In Aramaic, the word has an exact parallel, shala. Remember that at the time of Jesus, the common language in Israel, the language that Jesus himself spoke, was not Hebrew but Aramaic. In that first century of Jewish culture, the Shala was an official representative of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of Israel. A Shala exercised all the rights of the Sanhedrin. He spoke for them, and when he did speak, it was with his authority. It was accorded the same respect and deference as the council itself. But he never delivered his own message. His task was to deliver the message of the group he represented. The office of a shala was well known. The shala were in charge of settling legal or religious disputes, and acted with the full authority of the full council. Some prominent rabbis also had their shalas, envoys, who taught their message and represented them with all their authority. Even the Jewish Mishnah, which was a collection of oral traditions originally conceived as a commentary on the law, recognized the function of the shala. It says, The one sent by man is like man himself. So the nature of the charge was well known to the Jewish people. So when Jesus appointed apostles, he was saying something very familiar to people in that culture. These were his delegates. They were his trusted outlets. They spoke with their authority, delivered their message, and exercised their authority. Homework. The family office of the Shala in that culture virtually defined the task of the apostles. Obviously, Christ would delegate his authority to these twelve and send them out with his message. They would represent him as official delegates. Virtually everyone in that culture instantly understood the nature of the position or office. These twelve men, commissioned as apostles of Jesus, would speak and act with the same authority as the one who sent them. Apostle, therefore, was a title of great respect and privilege. Mark 3 chapter 14 records this very fact, and he appointed twelve to be with him, and to send them out to preach. Note the two-step process. Before they were sent to preach, he drew them to himself. It was absolutely necessary that they be with Jesus before they were sent out. In fact, it is not until Luke 9 verse 1 that Jesus gathers the twelve and gives them authority over demons and power to heal diseases. At that point, he literally delegated his miraculous power to them. That is why in Luke 6, he identifies them, names them, and places them under his direct and personal guardianship, that they might be with him. In Luke 9, several months later, he gives them power to perform miracles and cast out demons. It was not until then that he, sent them to preach. Until this time, most of the time Jesus had been speaking to large crowds. With the calling of the Twelve in Luke 6, his teaching ministry becomes more intimate, focusing primarily on them. He could still draw crowds and teach them, but his focus was on the disciples and their training. Notice the natural development in his training program. At first, they simply followed Jesus, gleaning from his sermons for the crowds and listening to his instructions along with a larger group of disciples. Apparently they did this not as their only task, but when they could in the course of their regular daily activities. Then, as written in Matthew 4, he called them to leave everything and follow him exclusively. Now in the incident recorded by Luke chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 10, he selects 12 from the group of disciples who served him full-time, identifies them as apostles, and begins to focus more of his energies on instructing them personally. Later, he would endow them with authority and power to perform miracles. Finally, I would send them. 
At first, on assignments characterized by short missions after which they had to return. But when he left to return to the Father, the disciples had to go out on their own. There is a clear progression in his training and his subsequent entry into a full-time ministry. They are no longer disciples, but now they are apostles, Shala. They now hold a position, an important office. In his gospel, Luke uses the word, apostles, six times, and in deeds, about thirty times. Their role in the Gospels is basically to bring the message of the kingdom to Israel. In Acts, they work on the founding of the church. Although these were ordinary men, their calling was an uncommon calling. In other words, what is important is not the men they were in themselves, but the task to which they had been called. Imagine how unique his role had to be. Not only were they to found the church and provide central leadership as the early church grew and multiplied, but they were also to be the channels through which most of the New Testament would be given. They received the truth from God through divine revelation. Ephesians 3 verse 5 is very explicit about this. Paul says that the mystery of Christ, which in the beginning was not made known, is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. They did not preach a human message. The truth was given to them by direct revelation. They were, therefore, the source of all true church doctrine. Acts 2 verse 42 describes the activities of the early church in these terms, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Before the New Testament was completed, the Apostles' teaching was the only source of truth about Christ and the doctrine of the Church. And his teaching was received with the same authority as the written Word. In fact, the written New Testament is nothing more than the inscribed and Spirit-inspired records of the Apostles' teaching. So the Apostles had the mission of building the Church. Ephesians 4 verses 11 and 12 say that Christ gave the apostles, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. They were the original Christian teachers and preachers. His teaching, recorded in the New Testament, is the only rule by which, even today, sound doctrine can be proven. They were also examples of virtue. Ephesians 3 verse 5 calls them, holy apostles. They set a model for holiness and true spirituality. They became the first examples that believers could imitate. They were men of character and integrity, setting the pattern for later leaders in the church. They had the special power to perform miracles to confirm their message. Hebrews 2 verses 3 and 4 says that salvation, having first been announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard, God testifying with them, with signs and wonders and various miracles and distributions of the Holy Spirit according to his will. In other words, God confirmed his word through the apostles by the miracles they were able to perform. The New Testament indicates that only the apostles and those closely associated with them had the power to perform miracles. That is why the second letter to the Corinthians 12 verse 12 speaks of such miracles as, the signs of the apostle. As a result of all this, the disciples were greatly blessed and held in high esteem by God's people. Jesus' expectations for them were achieved through their faithful perseverance. And his promise to them was fulfilled in the growth and expansion of the church. Remember that in Luke 18 verse 28, Peter says to Jesus, Behold, we have left our possessions and have followed you. Apparently, the disciples were worried about the way things were going and what might happen to them. Actually, Peter's words were a plea. It is as if he were saying, on behalf of the others, what is going to happen to us? Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, 
There is no one who has left home, or parents, or brothers, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God, who will not receive much more at this time, and in the age to come eternal life. They did not have to leave anything for which the Lord could not reward them. And God blessed them in this life even though, as we will see when we study each other's lives, most were martyrs. God blessed them in this life through the founding and growth of the church. They were not only influential, respected, and honored among God's people, but in their homes and families, they had multitudes of children and spiritual brothers as the church grew and believers multiplied. And in the age to come they will also be greatly honored. The training. All of this may have seemed remote and uncertain that morning that Jesus called his disciples and named the twelve. They still needed teaching. All his human limitations and failures seemed to cloud his potential. There was little time left. They had abandoned all the things in which they were experts. They had left their nets, abandoned their fields, and left behind the tax-collecting tables. They had given up what they knew to be trained in something for which they had no natural aptitude. But when they quit their jobs, they by no means became idle. They became full-time students, apprentices, disciples. The next 18 months of their lives would be occupied with even more intensive training, the best teaching any seminary could ever offer. They had constantly before them the example of Christ. They could listen to his teaching, ask him questions, observe the way he dealt with people, and enjoy an intimate relationship with him in all circumstances. The Lord gave them opportunities to minister, prepared them, and sent them on special assignments. He lovingly encouraged them, lovingly corrected them, and was patient in teaching them. This is how the best learning is always achieved. It is not just providing information. It is a life invested in another life. But it was not an easy process. The twelve could be clumsy. There was a reason they weren't the academic elite. We often find Jesus saying things like this. Are you also still without understanding? Don't you understand yet? Matthew 15 verses 16 and 17, compare chapter 16 verse 9. O fools, and slow of heart to believe. Luke 24 verse 25. It is interesting to note that the writing does not cover up its flaws. Because it is not about projecting them as super-sanctified luminaries or elevating them from the category of mere mortal beings. If that had been the case, there would be no reason to record his weaknesses of character. But instead of hiding its flaws, writing seems to want to highlight its human weaknesses. It is a magnificent reminder that, our faith is not founded on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 5. Why was the learning process so difficult for the apostles? First, because they lacked spiritual understanding. They were slow to hear and slow to understand. On many occasions they were dense, foolish, clumsy and blind. The New Testament uses all of these terms or their equivalents to refer to them. So how did Jesus resolve his lack of spiritual understanding? He continued to teach them. Even after his resurrection, he stayed on earth for 40 days. Acts 1 verse 3 says that during this time he kept, speaking to them about the kingdom of God. And he continued teaching them until the very moment he ascended into heaven. A second problem that made the learning process difficult for the disciples is that they were not humble. They were people who cared only about themselves, they focused on their own interests, they were careerists and proud. They spent an enormous amount of time discussing which was the most important among them, Matthew 20 verses 20 to 28, Mark 9 verses 33 to 37, and Luke 9 verse 46.
How did Jesus overcome that lack of humility? Being himself an example of humility. He washed their feet. He taught them to be servants. He humbled himself, even to death on a cross. Third, they not only lacked understanding and humility, they also lacked faith. Only in the Gospel of Matthew does Jesus say to them four times, O oh, you of little faith, chapter 6 verse 30, chapter 8 verse 26, chapter 14 verse 31, and chapter 16 verse 8. In Mark 4 verse 40, he asks them, How come you have no faith? At the end of Mark's Gospel, after having spent months of intensive learning with Jesus, and even after he had risen from the dead, Mark writes, and he reproached them for his unbelief and hardness of heart. Mark 16 verse 14. What was the remedy that Jesus applied for his lack of faith? He continued to perform miracles and portentous events. Miracles were not primarily for the benefit of unbelievers. Most of his miracles were done deliberately, in the presence of his disciples, so that their faith might be strengthened. John 20 verse 30. Fourth, they lacked commitment. While the crowds were jubilant and miracles multiplied, they were overjoyed. But when the soldiers burst into the garden to arrest Jesus, they abandoned him and fled. Mark 14 verse 50. The leader of the group ended up denying his teacher and swearing that he had never seen such a man. How did Jesus remedy his tendency to defection? interceding for them in prayer. John 17 tells how Jesus prayed that they would remain faithful so that the Father would take them to heaven, verses 11 to 26. Fifth, they lacked power. In their own forces, they were weak and defenseless, especially when they had to face the enemy. There were times when they tried but could not cast out demons. Their lack of faith made them unable to wield the power that was at their disposal. What did Jesus do to remedy this deficiency? On the day of Pentecost he sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in them and give them power. He had promised them so when he told them, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, Acts 1 verse 8. That promise was powerfully fulfilled. We are inclined to look at this group with all its weaknesses and wonder why Jesus would not choose a different class of men. Why select men without understanding, without humility, without faith, without commitment and without power? Simply because of this, because his power is perfected in weakness, second letter to the Corinthians 12 verse 9. Again we see how he chooses the weak things of this world to confuse the strong. No one could study this group of men and come to the conclusion that what they did they did thanks to their innate abilities. There is no human explanation for the influence of the apostles. Glory is solely for God. Acts 4 verse 13 says this about the way the people of Jerusalem perceived the apostles. Then seeing the boldness of Peter and John, and knowing that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed, and they recognized them that they had been with Jesus. The Greek text says that people perceived that they were, spasmenoi antras, literally, ignorant without education. And this was true from a human perspective. But it was obvious that they had been with Jesus. The same should be said of every true disciple. Luke 6 verse 40 says, The disciple is not superior to his teacher, but everyone who is perfected will be like his teacher. The relatively brief training time the apostles had with Jesus bore eternal fruit. At first, it may have seemed that everything had been fruitless, much for nothing. The night Jesus was betrayed, they scattered like sheep whose shepherd has been brutally wounded, Matthew 26 verse 31. Even after the resurrection they seemed timid, 
full of remorse for their failure, and too preoccupied with their own weaknesses to minister with confidence. But after Jesus finished ascending into heaven the Holy Spirit came, empowered them, and enabled them to do what Jesus had trained them to do. The book of Acts records how the church started, and the rest is part of history. Those men, through the legacy of the New Testament and the testimony they left behind, continue to change the world today. Dear listening friend, on behalf of the, the Christian Polyglot, team we greet you and we are pleased that you enjoy this channel created and designed for you, where you can listen to the adaptations of the best Christian titles in your language. Books written by renowned authors in the Christian field and inspired by the Word of God. We encourage you to join us and enjoy this new audiobook series entitled, 12 Ordinary Men, written by Pastor John MacArthur, author of this and other famous titles. John MacArthur born in Los Angeles, California, on June 19, 1939, is an American pastor and author, known for his internationally syndicated Christian teaching radio show, Grace to You. He is the pastor and teacher of Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California since February 9, 1969 and is currently also the president of the Master's College in Newhall, California and of the Teacher's Seminary in Los Angeles. Contrary to popular belief, we do not have to be perfect to do God's work. John MacArthur examines the 12 men Christ chose as his disciples and helps us discover how we can transform our own imperfections into useful tools to impact others. Without going any further, the weaknesses of the 12 disciples are preserved forever through the pages of the New Testament. Jesus chose ordinary people, such as fishermen, tax collectors, fanatical politicians, and turned their weaknesses into strengths, producing greatness out of utter uselessness. MacArthur outlines principles of the careful training of the first 12 disciples, for modern disciples like you. Next week you invite you to follow us with a new chapter of this series entitled, 12 Ordinary Men. And if you like this video and the channel, we encourage you to support us to grow by giving, like, and subscribing so that we can continue working to bring you the best content. Until next week, God bless you.